here. Great. Well, I think that's all we have for business. So I'm just going to go uh, introduce uh, Meg. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Meg Lohman is known throughout the world as Canopy Meg. She's a global pioneer in forest canopy ecology. She's one of the world's foremost arbornauts, someone who explores and studies the vast forest canopies that make it what Meg has termed the Earth's eighth, eighth continent. A tireless educator, a strong advocate for girls, women, and minorities in science. Meg has published numerous books, is a sustainability advisor, contributes to boards, and speaks widely and frequently to diverse groups, schools, and international symposia and conferences. I'll put the uh, link uh, to her website in the chat. And you should also know that Meg is offering this talk in conjunction with Malaprox in Asheville, who are offering 10% off the cover price of, of her new book, Arbornaut, with the code Arbornaut now through November 15th. I'll put that in the chat as well. Okay, so uh, Meg, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so glad to host you here. Uh, welcome, and we'll uh, take it over to you. Hey, well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna try to do the screen share and let me know if it comes up. Is it okay? Hopefully it's okay. Uh, Looks good, Meg. Okay, well, away we go. So I'm really honored. North Carolina is my favorite, favorite place in the world. I was so honored to be the director of the Nature Research Center in Raleigh, and we built the amazing globe, which is the theater that broadcasts around the state. And we developed amazing exhibits to get people more involved in mother nature. And I guess my book is a bit of a segue to that. You know, how is it that we can have, you know, nature and humans and kids and biodiversity live together and so I just really was so honored to be published by Macmillan to say, here's the story of how on earth you can be a mom and a scientist and you can share some crazy stories, which I do. And uh, tonight I'll share a few of those with you. So thanks so much for hosting me. Um, and as soon as I can get this to advance, I will. So my life, unlike maybe uh, some of you um, was based around nature. I have to say it's pretty crazy, but suddenly there's this sense that a lot of scientists started their lives collecting things. I collected snakeskins and rocks and bird's nests and guess what, wildflowers. And I took my wildflower collection to the New York State Science Fair. I lived in very rural New York State in the 1960s and lo and behold, I got a second prize for this amazingly crazy collection of brown pressed flowers and surrounded by boys with their volcano experiments. I was totally amazed because I was really shy and I was such a geek, but it catapulted me into the sense of, you know, maybe a girl can really make it in science. And there weren't a lot of other incentives, but that little science fair project meant a lot at the time in fifth grade. Um, so my background is New England where the trees change color every year. And it was amazing to me to realize that guess what? Most of the trees in the world don't do this. Most of the trees live in the tropics and they stay green all year round. It, I didn't know about that till I grew up later, but for me, this was like an awesome show of cool tree stuff in my childhood to see all these reds and yellows and oranges. So it maybe inspired me a lot to become a botanist. And the other crazy thing in my life is that I grew up in this little town called Elmira. My family lived in Lauman, which was 10 miles away from Elmira, but that's where the train station stopped between New York and Buffalo. And I kind of laughed because I looked at my family tree really carefully. Nobody was a scientist except me, except my great grandparents did a lot of good things with their corn crops during the prohibition. And they actually, ended up creating this Lauman whiskey, which is pretty funny, and making use of the corn during the prohibition. But that was the closest to botany that anyone in my family ever came. So it's not like I came from a lineage of famous and wonderful scientists. And I try to tell this to girls and children because 
you know, a lot of people think you have to be connected to survive, but basically I don't think you do. You just have to maybe use your five senses and listen and hear and smell and taste and lo and behold, the world of nature opens up for you. Um, so suddenly I became this world famous or infamous Arbornaut. Um, again, you know, in the 1950s, we developed scuba gear and the world of aquanauts became a reality, which are those people who study undersea. In the 1960s, if you can believe it, we went to the moon and the world of astronauts became a reality. But it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually climbed a tree in our own backyards and suddenly found out that half of the world's biodiversity lives in the tops of trees. And lo and behold, here's this, what I call eighth continent, this new place that's so worthy of discovery that we never knew about even after undersea and outer space exploration, which is pretty amazing to think about. So here we go. In summary, half of the land-based species on the planet live in the tops of trees. But the sad thing is less than 10% have been classified, seen, discovered, photographed, and mainly because there aren't too many arbor nuts in the world. I was unquestionably the first or one of a handful of the first. And now we still only have a couple hundred in this whole arena where there are millions of species that we need to understand and research, including the baby sloths and the big sloths down here in Panama and South America, such cool canopy organisms that actually go down into the water occasionally and swim and poop and do other crazy things, but mostly they're a very much a canopy species. And other crazy things in the canopy, like this cute little water bear. If you don't know what water bears are, you need to Google after this talk, tardigrade, T-A-R-G-I-G-R-A-D-E, and find out that lo and behold, these really cute things, about 20 could live on your pinky fingernail, but they are a microscopic organism that lives in moisture. They love canopy leaves, foliage, moss, everything. Millions and millions of these things live in the tops of trees. Probably they're the commonest species in your backyard, but you never knew it, which is kind of crazy indeed. So here's a little quick chronology from my book called The Arbornauts, where I say, guess what? The first time we climbed trees was in the late 1970s. And the first time we figured out a way to take a group of people into the treetops was 1985, when I helped design a canopy walkway in Australia to take gangs of people at once. And then suddenly the canopy toolkit was opened up. We got construction cranes as a third method. We had ropes and harnesses in 1979. We had walkways in 1985, but in the early 1990s, we got some donations of a few cranes to put them up in tropical forests so people could look from the bucket and measure a lot of things they needed to measure. And then suddenly I came back from Australia to America and built the first canopy walkway in Massachusetts in 1992 at a college campus, meaning it's not public or open to the public, but it was a fabulous way for all my students to get amazing graduate school scholarships because they worked in this very cool first ever in North America canopy walkway, which was great. Um, we also had at the same time, some of my colleagues enticing me to join teams to work on inflatables, a third fabulous method of canopy research, actually a fourth. We have ropes and harnesses, we have construction cranes, we have walkways, and now we have inflatables, which is really cool. And then lo and behold, to try to bring everything down to the public eye, we made the first canopy walkway for the public here in Sarasota, Florida at Mayaka River State Park, 
the second largest wilderness area in Florida outside of the Everglades. And this little tiny walkway has become the conduit, the inspiration for amazing canopy programs that I will talk about in a sec second. And to build that, we developed a foundation, a 501c3, so people could make their donations to the walkway through the Tree Foundation. And this little itty bitty foundation, no money for real estate, no money for overhead or full-time salaries, is now funding tree projects in many, many countries of the world. And I'm really proud of that fact. So with that, we'll move on. Um, I used all of that history to write this book for Farah Strauss and Giroux called The Arbonaut. I hope you'll buy it. I'm not making this a book talk sales program, but I feel like if you could learn about how scientists work, what in my brain made me ask questions? I tried so hard in this book to explain how scientists think so you could have a sense of being in my shoes and understanding everything from climate change to biodiversity to coal products. You know, we just need to understand how does science work so we can figure other questions out. And the Arbonaut, of course, takes up the questions that we dealt with when we were first discovering the canopy. So enjoy, enjoy. And if you buy a book, maybe buy another one for a girl in science. I am the mother of two boys, so I love giving this book to boys. So maybe boys or girls, because guess what? Both genders need to participate in our conservation missions coming up. Um, so in the book, I talk a lot about, guess what? The value of trees. I've spoken at a lot of business schools and even alums of business schools, and none of them knew that trees were worth zillions of dollars to keep alive and make the planet healthy. They purify fresh water, they provide oxygen through photosynthesis, they provide sustainable timber, food, and clothing if we take care of the forest, they conserve soil if we keep their root systems healthy, and of course, they house this humongous amount of earth species. They store carbon in their wood. They control climate through their canopies, keeping track of rainfall and winds and amazing things you even didn't know about. And guess what? For two and a half billion people on the planet, trees and forests are the most special spiritual heritage. So they need trees in order to keep a wholesome life, keep their children and families intact, and we need to honor that, even if it's hard to create a dollar sign for spiritual heritage, we need to know that is a priceless gift that our forests give to us. So here's one of our first successes. We have a canopy walkway in Malaysia funded by one philanthropic donor that now has access to two million urban visitors a year to two mil million tourists a year. And so suddenly as a 40 year veteran of canopy science, I realized, guess what? These walkways can save forests, hire local people, educate visitors, and maybe even allow researchers, especially students to come and study all the biodiversity that's there. So that's been part, part of the book and the process. The other part of the book is that I'm a real uh, proponent of kids in trees. I would love you to raise your hand. Have you ever climbed a tree in your life? Woohoo! I think a lot of people are raising your hand. And you know what? We're all primates. We came from this amazing lineage of cool tree climbers and I think when kids go into trees, they get inspired, they get motivated. And so for me, it's a lot of time spent saying, how can we get kids into trees? And on the left and the middle are my children from the Meglam and Treetops camp in my hometown. Oh, excuse me, I got the hiccups because I drank water too fast. Um, but these girls have very little opportunity. I grew up in a pretty, you know, un you know, economic disadvantaged part of the country. But if you can get a girl up a tree, maybe you can, 
inspire their heritage, inspire their future. And on the right, you'll see kids, third graders in our canopy walkway in Sarasota, Florida, where guess what? They did drawings in science projects and suddenly they discovered a new species of weevil. And now they're published scientists at the age of 11. So I think every kid that climbs a tree can get empowered or they can also make a scientific discovery, which is really, really cool. And I love that. Um, I've had grants, thankfully, to make diversity a bigger place in canopy research. For five years, I had a project through the National Science Foundation to take mobility limited students in the canopy because I worked with a lot of African Americans. I worked with a lot of Latinos. I worked with girls in many, many years, but I realized that, you know, kids that have physical handicaps usually get excluded from tree research. So we created a project where kids could climb trees and we created the methodology where even in a wheelchair, they could vault from their wheelchair into the treetops. And guess what? There's Rebecca on the left. And she discovered something like eight new species up in the treetops of Kansas and the Amazon. So God bless her. There's all these amazing success stories for these kids who climbed into the canopy through this project. And here they all are. It's very inspiring, but it makes us realize that, you know, we need to be inclusive in science, especially in exploration where sometimes you think only the fittest and strongest kids can kind of do this stuff. Guess what? Everyone can. Women, minorities, even physical disabilities can access science. And I hope that's my biggest message for you tonight. Um, so I want to just turn to a case study. Why is it important to save trees? Like what in the heck is going on and what's going on in the world? And I'm embarrassed to tell you, but during my lifetime as a millennial, half of the world's primary forests have disappeared. So that's pretty scary. And guess what? You know, only the very fewest of fragments of forests exist in many, many developing countries where we need to really reach out and work on things really quickly. And one of them is Ethiopia, where I've been working for over 10 years. And I'm really proud about that because a lot of conservation doesn't really need money or data collection, but it needs trust and friendship with the local communities. And my project in Ethiopia is all based around churches. Here's the Coptic or Ethiopian Orthodox Church in the middle of this little grove of green. And these priests, of course, believe they are the stewards of all of God's creatures. And I, as a conservation biologist, believe I am the steward of conservation of biodiversity. So lo and behold, we created this amazing partnership in Ethiopia, science and religion, which isn't supposed to go together, but some how it does because we all want to save these last remnants of the birds, the animals, the insects, the plants, which are these little church forests in Ethiopia. So here's how it looks on Google Earth. It's a little scary. Most of this is subsistence agriculture because Ethiopia doesn't have irrigation or tractors or any of the stuff that we all thought that you know, all these big NGOs like World Wildlife Fund or Gates Foundation were providing everywhere in the world, but a lot of places are void. And the only remaining little forests are these church forests with the tiny round church roof in the middle. So what to do about this? Holy cow, I was privileged to meet the only conservation biologist in Northern Ethiopia and to Together, we have forged this relationship between religion and science. Here's the chief priest in the Bahir district. And together we are saying, you know what? We need to save these trees. How could we save these trees? Two things. One is education of the priests in the villages. And the other is building conservation walls to keep the cattle and sheep out from eating the trees and saplings 
to keep the farmers from actually clearing the edges too much so the trees die back. So lo and behold, we've had this amazing success in the last 10 years. And one thing that I do a lot is give these workshops for the priests, sometimes 150 priests, one woman, one white person, which is me, and a lot of priests who don't have access to computers or any kind of cell phone or any information that would tell them, guess what? Your church forest is one of a handful of places where the native biodiversity still exists. So we need to tell them this so they understand the importance of their neighborhood. And that's really great. And on their own volition, the priests said to me, what if we build walls? What if we save the biodiversity, give the farmers the privilege of removing the stones from their fields, keep the cattle out? And so lo and behold, we now have this twofold solution of education and building conservation walls, which is really great. And the third problem over there yet to be solved is how do we educate the next generation of priests, the next generation of leaders? So part of my issue is let's consider environmental education programs that don't need computers or iPhones or textbooks because these kids don't have any of those kind of resources. So we need to say, okay, what can they have? And one of the things I did come up with was this children's book that I wrote in English called Beza, Saving the Force of Ethiopia, One Church at a Time, where I wrote about the local issues of saving trees, why trees are important. I picked a girl as a fictional person for my role model in hopes of advancing women in a country like this. And guess what? We published it. And every copy on Amazon.com that anybody buys costs twice as much. It costs $20, even though it only costs 10 to produce the book. But with that remaining $10, we produce a copy in Amharic, the Ethiopian language. And we take those books and distribute them to rural schools in Ethiopia. And even though I've done conservation all my life, the most tearful time for me is taking these amazing books to kids in rural Ethiopia who have never owned a book, a pencil, a paper, and anything. And all of a sudden they get this treasure to take home to their family. So it's really powerful to give a message in the local language and a message for something that maybe isn't part of their culture or economics. And, we need to do more of this. It's not difficult. It's just a matter of finding the right relationships with local people to make this happen. So here's the book, Beza. I hope you will go out and buy 20 copies and then we'll take 20 copies to Ethiopia next year. Um, even though I'm here to sell my own book, I really feel for me, it's also important to market something that's helping to save the trees of the world, which Beza really is. And here are the walls we're building based on all of that great information about saving these very special native forest patches in Ethiopia. And it's not unlike about 20 other countries, which I'll tell you in a minute, but you can see the difference between inside the wall and outside the wall, extraordinary. Um, and you can also see that we've, you know, developed surveys to look at what lives there. We're trying hard to do that, but most of all, we're trying to save the forest, which is important. And why are we doing that? Holy cow, I think you all know, but the international challenges that fires, clearing, climate change, which dries forests and creates more fires and more clearing and more insect outbreaks are all just totally harming our forests. And as I mentioned before, half of the world's primary forests have disappeared in my lifetime, which was horrible. And the next half is probably due to disappear in the next 10 or 20 years due to climate change if we don't hurry up and figure out some solutions. So I had to end my newest book on a positive message. So the last chapter is based on a new program I've just launched in the last year called Mission Green. 
which is how do I use my 45 years of treetop exploration and connectivity to so many countries in the, around the world and figure out a way to make sure that we can save forests, save indigenous people's lifestyles who live in those forests and create research incentives for kids to go and study this extraordinary biodiversity that nobody has ever studied before. So hence Mission Green. And I give a tribute to my friend from long time named Sylvia Earle, who is an oceanographer and aquanaut. And in 2010, she developed Mission Blue to draw attention to the hope spots in the ocean, which need to be saved. So similarly, I am drawing attention to the hot spots on the land which need to be saved, not funding them, not doing too much except bringing attention. And my partner in crime, the head of my advisory board is Ed O. Wilson from Harvard, who is quintessentially probably the biggest expert on biodiversity in the planet. And in his book, Half Earth, he interviewed 15 scientists, including myself, saying, what are the most important places to save? And from the list of these experts around the world, I have extracted the 10 forests that are the most, most important to save. And that is where Mission Green is originating. So we have our advisory board, we have people from around the world, we have famous scientists, we have famous explorers, and we will go from there and say, what are those 10 places? And we have Florida, we have redwood forests in Madagascar and Mozambique and India and Bhutan and Amazon and so forth and so on. So at each site, we have some slightly different levels of need for example, in Malaysia, we have the walkway built, which is fantastic. In Florida, we have the walkway built, which is fantastic, but we can afford to get grants to trial new education methods. We are planning to go to Madagascar next April to measure for their walkway, which is half funded at this point in time, but we sure need the other half of the funds a million dollars per site to develop the engineering, the construction, the education programs for local girls and indigenous families, and then the marketing back in other parts of the world so people will come there and visit. So it's all truly happening, which is really great. And to be honest and humble, it is like triage in a hospital emergency room. Forests are disappearing. They have exceeded the tipping point of survivability. And if we don't save them, our kids and grandkids are toast. They are purely unable to live on this planet. So we need to do everything. We need to turn somersaults and turn our AC down or stop buying clothes or do whatever it takes to make sure that this planet can be not exceeding the temperature ranges for the climate change conferences in Glasgow right now, because our kids deserve us to give them a chance. And I'm praying that all of us will participate. So I do invite you to join this mission. Uh, we have a website, www.treefoundation.org for people who are interested in forests. I have a book called The Arbonaut, which mentions a lot of NGOs, including marine and terrestrial ones, if you're interested in any kind of diverse opportunities to help save forests. But most importantly, read books, share them with kids, take kids outside. And I truly, truly hope that you will enjoy my book. Even as a woman in science, I feel there is a story to tell. And I'm really hopeful that both genders will read it and appreciate the value of trees. So thank you so much. Meg, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so inspired and I'm ready to run out to the, to the latest canopy walkway to see what's up there. Uh, <laughs> good. Yeah, so we, we'd love to host any questions you have for Meg and you can raise your hand and we'll call on you or type in the chat and have some conversation with Meg after her presentation.
I also see that a bookstore in Nashville is offering 10% on the book. So I just saw that in the chat room. That's really sweet. Yes, Metal Props is our kind of premier local bookstore. So we'd right. like to support local when we can. So Meg, I have a quick question to start off with. Maybe you could talk about why are the treetops so biodiverse? What are the conditions that create such biodiversity? Oh, in that, yeah, in that what a great question. Thanks so much for asking that. And you know what? When you think about it, it's what I call hit you over the head science. Guess what? At the top of the tree, it's where all the sunlight hits the tree, all the rain hits the tree. <clears throat> so not surprisingly, it's where all the leaves leaf, all the uh, fruits flower, all the flowers flower, you know, all the action is happening. <clears throat> Nothing can happen at the bottom of the tree where there's only 1% light. So here's this amazing hotspot for tree growth. So the insects go there, the birds that eat insects go there, the animals that eat insects go there. So all of a sudden you have this extraordinary, really cool place where all the activity is going on. And when you think about the light and the rain and everything else, you say, oh my gosh, it makes perfect sense. It totally does, thank you. <coughs> I've got a, a question about uh, future research practices because I've, I've been up in a canopy uh, tower in Panama as well as, as a crane there. And you know, it's, it's really incredible, but they are also doing um, new methods with drones and more so for tracking wildlife, um, specifically on the Smithsonian Research Island, uh, acronym. Yeah, Colorado Island, yeah. yeah correct. Um, and I was wondering if you know of, you know, the new practices for, you know, finding biodiversity or how drones are used to kind of increase the efficiency of, of canopy studies. Sure, and drones are awesome and cool. And there's a couple other sort of similar things. One called LIDAR, which is light imaging above the canopy and satellite imaging is also very cool. And I actually did host one of the first drone conferences in San Francisco when I was the director of science at the California Academy of Science, because the makers of drones and the users of drones tended to be out there in Silicon Valley, not surprisingly. So we did a lot of very cool stuff five years ago. Drones are fabulous for finding things like poaching, uh, flowering trees, uh, coloration of water where toxic chemicals have been emitted, but they cannot home in on what we call ground truthing, meaning what insect is eating what leaf, uh, what kinds of leaves are being eaten, what kinds of canopy levels are more vulnerable than others to attack by enemies like fungi or insects. So we need a combination of aerial techniques with still those people that climb trees or get access to trees to answer the detailed questions about forest health. Um, so don't underestimate drones, but drones alone can't do the kind of examinations. And the crazy thing is, so we still need perspiration and inspiration to come from all these young students that might want to climb the trees to figure out which insect is it, and then how do we control that insect, and which actual epiphyte or you know air plant on the tree is being eaten more than others because the drones can't quite home in on that level of detail yet. But we love, love drones because they have saved me from climbing hundreds of trees. Great, thank you for your answer. Um, I, I was wondering what you thought of sort of farm trees, wh whether it's for pulp wood or North Carolina, there's a big business in wood chips. So in these sort of very homogeneous pine forests. Is there much diversity there? And, and how does it stack up versus native forests? Yeah, thanks, Robert, for asking that. And of course, I'm a lover of North Carolina as the ex-director of your Nature Research Center in Raleigh. And oh, the people in North Carolina and the forests are the best, best, best in the world. Um, you know, those 
planted plantations serve a purpose, which is providing materials like pencils and paper and other things. They do not provide a big home for biodiversity. Let's face it, we do not want North Carolina to be covered by planted trees because you will lose a lot of your biodiversity. You have to hang on and protect the primary forests and the diverse forests that you have. We need those for our own harvest and in areas that are cleared already for other reasons, maybe farming from the past or you know, cities where they've died back a little bit and they have extra lots, um, you know, planting those kinds of products are useful, but you should never, ever, ever now cut down your primary forest to make room for those economic products because you're really trading gold for very cheap tin. <laughs> and so you need to protect the real forest, but, you know, use those uh, economic plantations where they are available and possible to plant. Uh, Penrose has a question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, Penrose, and, and then Helen. Yeah, sounds like thank, Yeah, yeah. Meg, thanks for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, can you? So, increasing carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels. How are they affecting canopy ecology? Oh, right. Great question. Well, you know, on the initial phases, we had research a couple of years ago saying, you know what? More CO2 helps trees grow faster. It helps poison ivy grow faster too. It helps every plant grow faster, but there is a limit. And there are two things that are limiting. One is the wood produced by fast tree growth is not necessarily very good wood. And the second thing is, expanded tree growth doesn't grow forever. It's not necessarily a good thing for the tree either, as we're finding out, you know, trees don't just keep growing like Jack and the Beanstalk to a thousand feet tall, they have limits and sometimes slower growth, like with humans, if you take great big hormones and steroids to develop your muscles faster, it doesn't mean you're gonna have the coolest body on the planet. So we now know that the increased carbon dioxide is maybe a short-term benefit for some kinds of plants, but it's not really going to make the planet greener and better in the long term. So we can't just say to ourselves, hey, guess what? Polluting the planet with CO2 is helping all the plants because it ain't the fact. It ain't. <sighs> Could I follow that up with another question? Sure. I just I just finished reading a brilliant book about um, this fella Plotkin who spent some time in Suriname. Oh. You, you, so you know the book. I know him very well. <laughs> oh, you do. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, it was a it was a really good book, and in it he talks about you know how some of the cultures there and the shaman that find all these medicinal herbs and plants and such that are uh, we're we're losing those cultures I guess and um, the shaman don't climb trees I don't think there's one shaman that goes up into the treetops but they still find all these wonderful herbs and such yep. Yep. what would happen and I guess my question is what would happen if a shaman went up to the canopy oh my gosh. and looked around well and there is a crazy movie called Medicine Man with Sean Connery. You might have heard about yeah. that. It's yeah. one of my favorites, even though it wasn't it wasn't popular in Hollywood because I guess he didn't do a good enough job. But, you know, the bottom line is in the world of forests, the bottom of the tree is so different from the top. So th those medicines at the bottom are fabulous. But at the top, there's a thousand more. So there's huge amounts of opportunity. And where I work in the Amazon, a little different from Mark Plotkin, because we have canopy access. The shamans are thrilled because they find so many more things. Where I work in Ethiopia, the shamans find everything in the top of the tree versus the bottom because the trees aren't quite as tall as they are in other parts of the world. So just know that every leaf and every layer in the tree has a different chemistry and that's what the shamans use. So probably the cure for cancer is at the top of a tree 
and the shaman hasn't got there yet, or it's in Ethiopia where nobody has researched it. So basically it would be like my saying to you, let's go and burn all the paintings in the Metropolitan Museum and let's burn the Louvre while we're at it because we don't care. But if we burn more forests, we lose these valuable products without even knowing what they are. And so many of them we now know are at the top of the tree, but they haven't been accessed yet. So That's it's right. really tragic. So keep, you know, stay tuned. We need to save the whole forest. We can, of course, just save the bottom of the forest anyway, but the top of the forest is relatively unexplored and full of chemicals and insects and leaf material that we haven't in the, you know, apothecary world ever even studied yet. So it's an exciting opportunity for any chemist or any kind of doctor, or hopefully any drug company to say, let's get our heads around this and do something. Thank you. Thank you, Penrose. Helen, you were next, go ahead. So following up on the top of the tree, you mentioned tardigrades, which is a hot topic here in Western North Carolina. I'm thinking of Par Paul Bartles at Warren Wilson, who um, gave us the talk about tardigrades. Do they differ in the, in the canopy? I'm just interested. I'm assuming, and I don't know enough about Dr. Bartles' research to know if he's gone up into a canopy to look. Um, I know he's gone into the Great Smokies, but any thoughts about what uh, water bears, tardigrades are like up in the canopy? Oh my gosh, I like my favorite subject. Guess what? You know, I guess I am sort of a spokesman for canopy, uh, for tardigrade people. And one of my whole chapters is about tardigrades and those kids in the wheelchairs that I illustrated were actually surveying tardigrades and the eight new species we found in Kansas and more in the Redwoods and more in Massachusetts and Florida were all tardigrades, mostly because, you know, if you have kids with a disadvantage, you don't want them to go up to a tree and say, we'll find the beetle that 20,000 other people have already found. We said, let's figure out a phylum or a group that nobody's ever found. So we actually focused on tardigrades and it was so exciting and special. And so over time, I guess I've become a world tardigrade expert in the canopy and they are the commonest thing in the canopy. When I give lectures in New York City or San Francisco, I say like, what's the commonest thing in your backyard? And they all say blue jays or crows, but Guess what? You know, it's tardigrades by far. There are millions of them in your canopies and they're definitely up there. Uh, we participated in the Great Smoky Mountain Biodiversity Survey years ago, which I think might have been part of the data you were looking at. And we found a lot of new species. My colleague, uh, Dr. Tardigrade Randy Miller and I, who hosted this project, and um, we found tardigrades in Antarctica. We found tardigrades in Russia and blah, blah, blah. So they are so cool. They're, as we call it, extremophile organisms, but they need moisture. They live in the drops of water on leaves, the drops of water on moss, on bark, and in a rainforest. Can you imagine if you're a tardigrade in a rainforest? you would proliferate everywhere because you have zillions of drops of water. So they are an incredibly important species that we know next to nothing about and expect to know that maybe they are the next cure to something. You know, people are studying them now for med medical reasons because they're resilient, because they're able to do these crazy things with their bodies, like go into dormancy. So maybe someday we'll all be like tardigrades and be able to live out climate change as a little tiny sphere and who knows, but they're really cool and they're very, very important in the canopy and very prolific. Great, thank you. There's a follow-up question about, is there an encyclopedia to recently discovered tardigrades? Oh, what a cool question. Yeah. You know what? I don't know that, but if you want to email me, I'll send it out to my tardigrade team and we can find out. I don't think there is. And unfortunately, in the world of biodiversity, as you might have seen on one of my slides, 90% of what's in the canopy has not been discovered, meaning only 10% has been classified or discovered. And say if a quarter of those are tardigrades, which is very likely and possible, 
guess what? They're just off the grid right now. And it's tragic, but we just don't have the manpower or the funding what, which NASA has or Physic Particle Accelerator Research has. You know, biodiversity research is this teensy piece. And that's why the last chapter of my book called Mission Green is all about how do we save these species? How do we conserve these species? Because I think a lot of us don't recognize that we're not really trying to help planet Earth. We're all over the place. I want Jeff Bezos to say, guess what? I founded Amazon, but I could save the Amazon with my money. You know, I want Elon Musk to say, let's like save planet Earth before we go into outer space. And I think there's a lot of potential, but the budgets we have for conservation are this big, you know, they're so teensy. And so we can't do that kind of research to answer the questions that people need to know about what lives on planet Earth, which is kind of sad. No, thank you. Are there other questions? I have another question real quick. Just thinking about, you know, funding, how much would you say, you know, the research that is done through canopy studies and other conservation based studies has an effect on policies like how, how effective of an influential like how influential is it as a tool. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, as you know, we have probably don't set billions of dollars to Brazil to the government to try to help conservation of rainforests and it has only gone into the pockets of politicians and very little has probably gone into good causes so hence my small but effective foundation www.treefoundation.org where we try very hard to look at who are the ground level people that can help with conservation and how can we help with conservation and that's why I started this project called Mission Green. We were on a race $10 million to save the 10 highest biodiversity forests of the world. That's not a lot of money based on NASA or any other kind of program. I'm sure we have you know, given billions of dollars to Brazil and it hasn't gone anywhere. And so my feeling is if we can develop these canopy walkways that hire local people, especially women and children, and allow them to develop ecotourism as a sustainable income so they no longer want to log their trees and sell them for $50 an acre, which is very disgusting to be honest. And they keep the forest and they make money for themselves and their kids to get educated then we can turn that around and it's really important because right now the whole conservation model is corrupt and skewed and we have to figure out how to change it. Now, my raising $10 million is nothing, but without a corporate sponsor, right now my biggest donors are fifth graders who send their lunch money because they so care about the planet. But, you know, we wanna build a walkway actually in the Great Smokies. That is the highest biodiversity area in the US. How many people know that or learn about it? Next to none, because we don't have a facility that sponsors that. You know, you can come to Disney World in Orlando and see plastic trees and say, oh, that's really cool. But you can't go to the Great Smoky Mountains and see the real thing and help us conserve the real thing. So we're so excited, but something like that could cost a corporate sponsor a million dollars with a lifetime return and huge amounts of schools and regeneration of intellect and capital and local jobs. But, you know, it's kind of like people still view nature as a free service. They don't think they need to pay for it. And that's why I think America's in big trouble because we still don't know how we should invest in nature. And that's really sad. So I'm just hopeful, hopeful, hopeful that we could have a walkway in your area. We can have $10 million to build walkways. Can you imagine if the Amazon Corporation donated $1 million to build a walkway in the Amazon? Do you know what small amount of that budget of amazon.com that would be? It's just like, to me, it's so crazy that we can't, 
get any leverage with some of the corporate sponsors, but I hope we will. And I'm thanking you for asking that question. I hope so too. We have a follow-up question about that. What national organization is doing the best job at protecting biodiversity? Uh, you know, two things. One is nobody's really protecting big trees that I know except us, www.treefoundation.org. A lot of organizations are planting trees. I love planting trees. Kids need to plant trees, schools plant trees, but it's hundreds of years before the biodiversity returns. Um, the best biodiversity research is usually through universities who sponsor students. And that's why with our tree foundation or little project, big project called Mission Green, we wanna fund students doing biodiversity research specifically because students write me every day and they say like, where should I go to do canopy research? And I say, I don't know. There is no place, there's no source, you know? And we had a great little gig at the Raleigh, at the North Carolina Museum for a while when I was in Raleigh, but that's gone away because I left. I, I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't, you know, necessarily carried on by anyone else to do canopy research in North Carolina. And so every time we, you know, the few of us that do this research leave a location, then the impetus is lost, but we need to say to ourselves, this is 50% of the biodiversity on earth. How are we gonna ensure that? You know, we have fabulous medical research in the triangle area and fabulous technology research with SAS and other places, but where's the biodiversity research going on? And Ed Wilson has led it, really in, but he's 92 years old, you know? And so we, we need, we need real epicenters for biodiversity research and we need it to be mostly in the canopy. And so I see somebody shouting out there, maybe it's, hello, Penrose. <laughs> That's, uh... Robert, Robert, Robert has Lisa, a question, uh, Lisa. I just, I wanted, see you. Uh, just wanted to follow up on your comment about uh, Mature forests are being sold for $50 an acre. That is that is horrible. You know, I just heard from you got a group in Uganda today that wants me to fund them. And they said, we are so crushed because our biggest trees uh, were just sold for $50 to loggers. And now we no longer have the fruits in our village anymore. And I, I just, you, you just can't imagine what's going on. And guess what? It's mostly American consumers. We have no idea what we're buying because we buy stuff and we don't check on the source and it makes me sick at heart. Alisa, go ahead. Meg, I just loved this talk. I. Um... It really just is thought provoking. I my first one of my first projects I did as a as a scientist was actually studying fig pollination and climbing trees. And now something I'm really interested in is really trying to sort of illuminate the many important roles that plants play in sort of our society, our culture, in conservation. And I'm just wondering if you have any just general advice for how, what are some ways that you've sort of tried to get people and successfully gotten them to kind of care about forests more so than maybe some of the things that we're consuming? Oh, thanks. And I, you probably haven't read the book yet, but chapter six is a lot about figs and how figs can influence women, help, they're an inspiration to me. They've been an inspiration to me for a long time, but you know what, I, over the years, I've advised Jane Goodall very quietly about plants because she writes me about plant questions and she's written books where she had plant issues and she's like, what's this, what's that? And of course she endorsed my book and she has the cover comment because suddenly she realizes her primates can't live without plants and everyone else thinks that. And even though they have the most charismatic megafauna, you know, you know, primates, dolphins, all these cool things, but the world is based on trees and it's been a very hard sell. I've always competed against all these zoology people that raise money at the drop of a hat because nobody wants to give money to plants, but suddenly people are saying like, holy cow, the plants are burning down, they're disappearing, the koalas are dying, you know, the sloths are dying, blah, blah, blah. And so maybe plants are coming into the fore and 
So I'm just hopeful, hopeful that my book can help sell plants in a more inspirational way than in the past, because they're just so critical to keep our kids and grandkids alive. We have time for a few more questions. There's one that uh, I missed uh, a few um, chats ago. Uh, the question is, how is it estimated how many species are undiscovered? Oh yeah, what a great question. And this is a crazy thing, but first of all, how is it estimated how many species there are, which was a colleague of mine who is now deceased, Terry Irwin, who first sprayed insecticide in a rainforest tree, if you can believe it, very devastating, but he, all the raining insects he got down and he did that about three times and figured out using a multiplier effect by the number of species said, holy cow, there's like 30 million species in the world, you know? And so that was the beginning of this estimate of how many species. And then Edward Wilson at Harvard said, wait a minute, out of that rain of insects, you missed all the microscopic things, you missed all the things hiding in bark. I think there's a hundred million species. And then we all went back and looked at how many did we already identify and classify? Maybe 10,000, you know, so we were able to do the math to make the model to say, holy cow, this is how many we know, this is how many we don't know. And like climate change in science, it's very difficult to make models and predictions, but it's the only thing that we can do. It's like fire insurance and health insurance. We make models and we say, this is the percentage of chance you have to do this. So we don't know for a fact, I'll be honest, but we can make a really good model based on the scientific numbers. And that's how come that all exists. Oh, wonderful. And any last questions before we thank Meg again and uh, talk about uh, our next uh, Tavern event, which is uh, related to this. I have a quick question. Um, and I have to say, I, I got the, I had the privilege of talking to Meg before all of this. Um, and my question was, is there something that people don't know about you or something, an, an interesting tidbit? And you talked about your um, appetite for insects. I think that would be a really fun way to end this talk. <laughs> oh my gosh, she was so cute. I love talking to Helen. She was so good. Um, but I did tell her that I'm an entomophagist. It sounds obscene, doesn't it? And so are my kids. But, you know, as we look at the world and planetary consumption of everything you know we it's not all about being vegetarian because where i used to live in australia eating meat was the most ecological thing in the world wherever you live you have to look at what is the most sustainable and ecological thing to eat and what i said to helen is in a lot of cultures like africa and south america eating insects is huge and they have fabulous recipes and I did a little, a cooking show in, down here at Sarasota TV about entomophagy with my little boys because we used to eat insects sometimes. And I think we need to be more open-minded about sustainable solutions. Everything from fashion to diet to whatever, like how can we live with a smaller energy footprint? And People always say to me, oh, how can you work in Ethiopia? These people have seven children. It must be disgusting. And I say, you know what? One Ethiopian, oh, actually one American energy footprint equals 17 Ethiopians. In other words, we are so obscene in what we consume and do with the mother earth's resources. We need to do differently. And eating insects is a great solution. Buying less clothing is a great solution. Buying sustainable products is a great solution. You have to make your own personal hygiene kind of you know, description. But now that we've had Glasgow giving up coal and a lot of energy solutions are gonna be very important in our future. I don't know how that's gonna come down, but if America does it, the whole world will do it. We are in power for the footprint of the world. And we need to know that everybody wants to copy us. If we eat insects, they'll eat insects. If we give up 
toxic chemicals, they'll give up toxic chemicals. If we give up coal, they'll give coal, uh, give up coal. So we have to know that we are the footprint and God bless us, but the whole world depends on us. And I don't think most people understand that. Hmm. Wow. Meg, thank you so much for your talk tonight. Uh, I'm inspired by your work. I'm gonna go out and buy your book. I put the uh, uh, your foundation's website in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna go find a canopy and get up in it. Okay. I'm so inspired. So thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Um, thank you all for listening. Yeah, and I'll, sp I'll spread the word, you know, as far as I can. So thank you again. Uh, and I'm gonna, so we'll give uh, Meg a big round of applause. Uh, Thank you again. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Yes, and I'm gonna have uh, oop, Elisa uh, talk about the next uh, next month's talk. All right, so if this really piqued everybody's interest, I think next month's talk will also do the same. Our next month's speaker is Professor Allison Ormsby at UNC Asheville, she's local here. And um, Dr. Ormsby is an environmental educator and human ecologist and her research focuses on the conservation of sacred forests in Ghana and West Africa. So um, I encourage, if this is your first time at, at the Asheville Science Tavern, I think you're, um, you, you'll really like next, next month's talk. All right, thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you, everyone. The Have a good the, week. The, uh, the YouTube channel is in the chat.